Good morning, everyone. This is Zhang Penli. I am a PhD student from Penn State. My research focuses on exploitation and defense in complex software, especially OS kernel and browser. In this talk, I'm going to talk about exploitation, specifically a new approach for more precise exploitability estimation. There are a lot of kernel bugs. Sysboot, the continuous kernel fuzzing platform, is a public platform that contains bugs found by syscaller. You can find the bug report and the POC to help you reproduce the bug. There are over 44,100 bugs found by syscaller in the past four years. Currently, there are 3,000 fixed bugs and over 1,000 open bugs. The open bugs hasn't had any fix yet. These unfixed open bugs are the potential public zero days. And the number of open bugs keeps growing. It grows by 100 bugs this year. It will be interesting to know their exploitability. If some exploitable bugs don't get enough attention from kernel developer and remain unfixed all the time, it leaves a large time window for attackers to write the exploits for those public zero days and attack kernel users. Studying the exploitability of those fixed bugs is also interesting because vendors don't adopt all the fixes from upstream. You can always find a lot of fixes from upstream being ignored by vendors. Those ignored fixes could contain critical fix to exploitable bugs, but they just don't know which one is critical because they don't know the, the actual exploitability of those bugs. Knowing the exploitability of them could give attacker the potentiality of finding zero days in vendor's kernel. From the defender's side, we should know the, know the exploitability before the attackers do. In general, studying exploitability of bugs gives you an estimation of the consequence of bugs, whether it's exploitable or not. When we know a bug is exploitable, we should fix them as soon as possible to reduce the time windows of being exploited because the attacker may have known the exploitability and started writing exploit. It should have the top priority compared to other bugs. Knowing the exploitability could also promote fixed adoption for vendors. Vendors have the responsibility of protecting end users when there is a critical fix for exploitable bug, they should adopt the fix immediately. Studying the exploitability could also guide the direction and the design of hardening. When we will find a new exploitation method that always can be used to exploit a certain type of bug, we say that the exploitability of this type of bug is increased. From that, we know that there is something missing in kernel to mitigate the attack and we know where the hardening should be working on. Knowing exploitability could have a huge impact on vulnerability ma management, but knowing exploitability is challenging. To prove the exploitability of a bug, the straightforward way is to write an exploit. However, kernel is a piece of complex software. It often takes experts days to write, write a working exploit. As a result, given the large amount of bugs in kernel, it's not realistic to utilize manual effort on it one by one. Another idea of determining exploitability is to prove unexploitability. If you can prove some certain type of bugs are unexploitable, you can conservatively treat the rest of them as exploitable. However, proving exploitability is even harder because you have to go through all the execution paths to prove that no path will lead to exploitation. This has shown in some academ academic research, and they prove the unexploitability on, on some toy examples. But when facing Linux kernel, which has millions of lines of code, it's not realis realistic currently. A practical way to do that is to appro approximate exploitability. That is, based on the error the bug has, we approximate the likelihood of exploiting the bug. But how to approximate the likelihood of exploitation? Can we, based on the read and write ability of UF and out of bound bugs? The answer is no. 
based on the read and write ability of some memory corruption bugs, it could give you a concrete result of memory corruption, for example, overwriting function pointers. But what, what if they don't? Meaning UF and out of bound bugs cannot override function pointers directly unless using some sophisticated exploitation method. And this may let you underestimate the exploitability when you cannot find the overwriting ability directly. In general, most of UF bugs and out of bound bugs are exploitable. For UF bugs, when you find the original UF object doesn't provide the overwriting ability, ability as you want, you can transfer the UF object to another one. After doing that, you can easily obtain another overwriting primitive. UF, ob UF bugs could also be used to leak kernel information and bypass mitigation. A recent research has shown that most of UF bugs in kernel could be utilized to do so. For out of bound bugs, a recent exploit right up showed that 40 byte overflow is powerful enough to demonstrate an exploitation in kernel. So it's very likely that other out of bound bugs with limited overwriting ability could be exploited in a similar way. Conservatively, we treat all the UF bugs and out of bound bugs as exploitable, since current kernel lack, lacks effective hardening for these types of memory corruption. The advance of offensive techniques have demonstrated that most UF bugs and out of bound bugs are exploitable. As such, we approximate the likelihood of exploitation based on the type of bugs. When a bug shows UF or out of bound error, we think they are very likely to be exploitable. For other types of bugs, like warning, general protection fault, non-pointer dereference, they are less likely to be exploitable. This approach of determining exploitability is straightforward and practical. It doesn't need any complex analysis and computation. We see how bug is like, and then we approximate. But the question is how reliable the, this approximation is. The answer is sometimes it could underestimate the exploitability because it's possible that a severe memory corruption just don't show memory corruption behavior and you don't know it's a memory corruption bug. For example, you see a warning behavior for a UF bug, so you don't know the bug could actually cause a UF error. And it's possible that a severe memory corruption bug only shows limited memory corruption ability. Even if you see the memory corruption behavior, you are not able to find memory cor corruption ability it actually has. For example, you only find a non-point dereference ability, which is considered unexploitable in Linux kernel, but the bug could actually cause a UF error. I have a detailed example for this in the following. So how can we improve the reliability? Our solution is to find the true effects of bugs. Here we discuss how the arrows of bugs found by, by, by the fuzzing tool is ignored by the fuzzing tool and how we solve it. There are several situations. The first situation is that syscaller generates incomplete arrows. When it fuzzes kernel, if the panic when warning is set, it will miss the potential case error right after the warning. On the left side, it's a bug report from Sysbot. Since the panic on warning is set, the kernel crashes right after generating the warning message. On the right side, it's a log of triggering the bug with the panic on warning flag disabled. A case on arrow shows in the following. Compare these two different logs, the case on arrow is not shown in the first one. The bug actually can cause a UF error, but due to the panic on warning setting, the case on arrow is missing. Another issue in this call is that it only reports the first arrow that the kernel triggers. 
This is another bug report from Sysboot. In the kernel log, you can find two arrows that the kernel triggers. However, syscaller only generates reports for the first one, ignoring the second. And we will see the report title for this bug is a warning arrow. In this case, the, case, the exploitable case arrow is ignored as well. So looking at how this happens, it's because a bug could generate several arrows of the triggering. When running a POC, you'll find several arrows triggered by the, by the kernel along the way. For example, the POC triggers the root cause and then calls a warning in kernel. And then the execution of POC make the kernel generate a case on arrow. The solution to this is trivial. We don't have to change anything in the input. We just need to capture all the arrows the kernel reports and present them accordingly. Other than that, there is another situation that we call it multiple arrow behaviors of bugs. And this is the, the main content I'm going to present today. So the multiple arrow behavior is that when we trigger the bug differently with different inputs and follow different execution paths, the bug shows different arrow behaviors. For example, a bug could be triggered and the case on generates a warning message where without observing any memory corruption. But if you trigger the same bug differently with a different input, you may find that you have error in another place, which is totally different to the warning error. And this is different from finding errors being ignored by this caller. In previous example, following the original execution path with, with the same input, you will be able to find the ignored UF arrow in the following. But here, you have to vary the execution path the, and to find the path that leads to the case on arrow, which is totally different to other ones leading to other behaviors. So to improve the reliability of exploitability estimation, we showed, we should expose multiple arrow behaviors as much as many as possible to avoid underestimation. Let me show you an example of how multiple error behaviors is like in kernel and discuss our approach to finding them. This is a real kernel bug and here are some code snippets of the bug. Don't worry, this is really simple and I will uh, be slow. So there are three functions contributing to the bug. Let's go through it one by one. The first one is the tongue attach function. The flag here is controlled by user. In this function, if the NAPI flag is enabled, it will initialize a timer and link current NAPI to the list in the device. Otherwise, it will not. And the second function we, will, we need to look at is the time detach. So these two are a pair, attach and detach. Here, if the NAPI flag is enabled, it will cancel the timer and remove the NAPI from the list. Otherwise, it will not. But eventually, it will destroy the file, and inside, inside the destroy, it will free the NAPI object properly. The last function we need to look at is the, the function to, pre, to free the device. When it's called, it will go through the NAPI list to see which one is still in the list and destroy it one by one. Now let's look at how the bug will happen. Since the time flag is controlled by user, users can specify inconsistent flag between the time attach function and the time detach function. Specifically, if users disable an API flag at time attach, the code here will not be executed. So there will be no timer and the NAPI object will not be in the list. And then the users enab enable the NAPI flag when calling time detach. It will cancel the timer 
and inside the timer cancel function, it will derive a, func a pointer. Uh, it will derive a pointer inside the timer object. But since the timer is not initialized, so there will be no valid pointer in the timer object. So the kernel will dereference a num pointer, dere will dereference a num pointer, and generate a num pointer dereference error. The bug could actually cause a total different error behavior if we trigger it differently. This time, we enable the NAPI flag in the time attach function. And we will execute the code here. We will have a timer initialized, and the current NAPI object will be linked in the list. And we disable the NAPI flag when calling time detach. So the code here will not be executed. And eventually, the NAPI object will still in the list, but it will be freed by the, the destroy of the, the file in the following. After this, we free the device. And the kernel will go over the NAPI list in the device and access to the NAPI object, which was freed in the time, attach, time detach function. And this will result in a UF error. This case tells us that if we follow the same execution path, we will never find other exploitable behavior of bugs. Now look at the exploitability of those two arrows. The exploitability of these two arrows is totally different as well. The execution to num pointer dereference arrow will always dereference a num pointer since the timer object is not initialized and there will be no valid pointer. In Linux kernel, mapping memory at zero address is not allowed, so this case is very less likely to be exploitable. However, exploiting the UF arrow for this bug is straightforward. The attacker can spray object to occupy the memory of the freed NAPI object, and then trigger a free of the device, which will destroy the NAPI object that the attacker controls. In, in the destroy, the kernel will free the, uh, the SKB in the NAPI object, and eventually it will call a function pointer inside the spray object. So the attacker can overwrite the function pointer to obtain the control flow hijacking ability. In summary, bugs may have multiple error behaviors. In this case, if we don't expose the UF error of the bug and only rely on the non pointer dereference behavior, we will probably underestimate the exploitability of this bug. But if we can find multiple error behaviors, we can have a more precise exploitability estimation and ease the process of developing exploit. In this case, it's from non pointer dereference to a very straightforward UF exploitation. Finding multiple error behaviors of bug is not trivial as shown in the motivating example, to find the bug's other error behaviors, we need to find a totally different execution path of triggering the bug. And we also don't want to have too many false positives, since it will make the exploitation estimation imprecise. If we don't have the input, we may not be able to reproduce the error behavior. As such, we don't consider using static analysis to find the Instead, we will use buzzing to find its other error behaviors. There are several challenges that we need to address when applying fuzzing on, on finding multiple error behaviors. First, we want to trigger the bug differently. In other words, we have to test the same code snippet over and over again, while the nature of fuzzing is to find as many new code coverage as possible, which is to maximize the code coverage the buzzing will easily detour the path to the bug, and it will test on other codes that are new to it. So the traditional buzzing, by design, will be not efficient. An enhancement to make sure the fuzzing will not detour is to restrict the fuzzing scope. However, the question here is how to restrict the fuzzing scope, and what is the proper scope for each bug? We don't want to have a very narrow scope or a very large one. 
If it's too narrow, we will miss the potential error behaviors. And if it's too large, it will be not efficient. It should depend on what the bug is like. Here we propose our approach based on some observation from kernel bugs. First, the design of Linux kernel is object-oriented. We use different objects to represent different protocols, different drivers, different kernel modules, and so on. Second, based on our observation, most kernel bugs result from incorrect usage of kernel object. In the motivating example, the bug results from incorrect usage of the town object, and the users can specify inconsistent flag between the town attach function and the town detach function. Third, when the incorrectness propagates to different places by the object, we will find an error behavior there. Based on these observations, we propose our, our approach as an object-driven fuzz, kernel fuzzing. The inside of our approach is to use the reachability of some kernel objects as an additional fuzzing feedback. When the bug is triggered differently, the feedback is different. In addition to that, the object is an ideal restriction of fuzzing scope. All the related code containing the operation of the object will be included. So there are two steps in our approach. We first use static analysis to find objects. Then we enhance kernel fuzzer using the reachability of this object as an additional feedback. This is the overview of the static analysis part. We take the crash report as input and then use back, back tent, backward tent analysis to identify the related kernel object. After identifying the object candidates, we use a heuristic to filter out abstract objects. For abstract objects, they are the object in the abstract layer, like file which represents the open file. When using them, they are initialized, they are in, in, instantialized into different types of files like time file in the motivating example. We have constructed a structure graph that connects all the structures based on their defini definition. If one structure is referenced by another one, there will be, will be an edge connecting them. Then we apply the page rank algorithm to calculate their popularity. For the top 5% object, we treat them as abstract ob object and we will not include them in the fuzzing. Here is the example of how we identify the object for fuzzing. We start from the code where the crash happens. In, the, in this case, it's a non-pointer dereference at the timer active function. Then we backward analyze the dev use chain of the data. Along the way, we collect the type information of the data flow. So in this, in this example, we first find the timer structure in the timer active function. Then we find an API struct and a time file in time attach function. After this, we will fill out the timer structure because it's too popular to represent a bug. With the object on hands, we then use a customized compiler to instrument basic blocks, which involved with the operation of critical objects. The instrumentation will send object feedback to the fuzzer when it's executed. So in addition to code coverage, we also have object coverage as a feedback to fuzzer. During the fuzzing, only inputs reaching these objects are interesting to fuzzer, and the fuzzer will try to find as much object coverage as possible. We implement our approach as a tool based on syscaller and had a large scale experiment on it. We randomly choose 60 kernel bugs found from 2017 to 2021. Each bug comes with a patch. We set up a separated virtual machine for each bug. And for the comparison, we run both this caller and our tool on these cases for seven days. After seven days, four bug reports found in each case we manu manually analyze the new found bug reports 
and find out ones and found which one tied to the same bug that we are analyzing. In this way, we will be able to evaluate how many error behaviors each tool found. Our results are twofold. The first part I want to discuss is the exploitability escalation. Among 60 kernel bugs, 44 of them are less likely to exploit bug, which are warning, general protection fault, info, non-point derivatives, and so on. In seven days, syscaller identified four of, four of them have other error behaviors that are likely to exploit. Our tool identified 26 of them are actually can cause likely to exploit behavior. In addition to that, we also found that on average, each bug in the dataset have, has three error behaviors. The second one is the exploit potential. In the dataset, 16 of them are likely to exploit bugs. We add them to the dataset because we want to evaluate the ability of finding more exploit potential of our, our tool. The ability help us find better primitives when writing exploit for bugs. For example, you find a UF, but it requires specific privilege to trigger. However, there may be other execution paths that don't require any privilege to trigger the same UF. Our tool can help you find the path automatically. In comparison, syscaller found that one of them has other exploit behaviors, while our tool successfully identified eight bugs have other exploit potential. In summary, our tool is much more efficient and effective than syscaller. If you look at the time used to find the new error behaviors, most of new error behaviors identified by our tool only takes minutes. Syscaller takes days to find them. In this sense, our tool is much more efficient than syscaller. I want to highlight several takeaways here. First, a kernel bug could have multiple error behaviors. In our experiment, we found that 34 out of 60 in our data set, our tool could find at least one additional error behavior. We believe this is not a coincidental issue just in kernel. Bugs in other complex software, like browser, may share the same issue. Second, multiple error behavior contributes to more precise exploitability estimation. Multiple error behavior represents different effects of bugs. Exposing all of possible error behaviors help us understand the worst effects of the bug. Our experiment showed that 26 out of 44 bugs in our data set could have a more precise exploitability estimation through exposing their other error behaviors. This not only benefits the defender, but also benefits the attacker potentially. Attacker could ex can easily find more straightforward exploitation paths through another error behavior exposed using our tool. I have an upcoming talk in Black Europe. In that talk, I will talk about a real world exploitation in CentOS kernel. The bug was found with a warning error first using our tool, which successfully turned the non memory corruption bug into an exploitable UF. And the UF demonstrated the, the um, demonstrate successful ex exploitation with all the mitigation bypassing. It's really interesting. Third, we have proposed an automatic approach that takes the bug reports as input to identify object and then utilize the object as an additional feedback to kernel father to find multiple error behaviors. So finding multiple error behaviors automatically is possible. Last, in comparison to syscaller, we showed that our approach utilizing kernel object as feedback is much more effective and efficient. That's all of my talk. I would like to thank my collaborator Yue Ji Chen for his help, and my advisor Xin Yu Xing and my mentor Kan Li for their guidance and advice. This is Zhen Penlin from Penn State. My research focuses on exploitation and defense especially for OS kernel and browser. I'm looking for internship for next summer, so if you know there is any opening, feel free to send me a message. 
Here is my Twitter, and you can find my other information from my personal website. Yeah, now I'm happy to take questions. Which one? Uh, the very first slide uh, on PowerPoint. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. This one? Yeah, no, with, with no, 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 yeah. Okay. Like that. And I don't explore the ability of these bugs that are unknown. How could we know that something is a bug and not know the exploitability? Does, does that make sense? Okay, so for exploitability, um, it's if a bug is exploitable, yeah. we think the bug has exploitability. Yeah. But not all of bug is exploitable. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For, expo for, ex for a successful exploitation, we think um, the, the, the attacker can you know, get an ideal operation on the system, but not bug allow them to do that. Thank you.